David, thank you for, for joining us. This week marked um, five, five years at the helm for you um, as the CEO of Telstra. When you took on that job after Salter EO departed abruptly, what did you think the key challenges for Telstra would be and how would you rate the way you've dealt with them? Uh, when I took over, I mean, there were a number of different challenges. Uh, firstly, our relationship with the government wasn't at an all-time high. Uh, secondly, we were, had just been made aware about our uh, failure in, in you know, participating in the NBN rollout. Uh, I think our culture around focusing on customers was not as strong as it had been. And I think that we had also a cost base that was not sustainable based on where the business was at. And I think then lastly, probably we were needing to get more innovative product into the market. So that were the five things that I can remember at the time uh, were really uh, preoccupying me. I, I do remember that moment at the press interview when I think someone said to me, you know, Mr. Trio, you know, Mr. Thody, Mr. Trio had, is a, was an agent of change. What would you stand for? And I said, well, I'm going to be an agent for the customer. And I think that's really been a lot of my focus in terms of uh, the business over the five years. So how have I gone? Uh, or how has the business gone, which I think is uh, more the point? Look, I think that the report card is we've made good progress, but still a long way to go. Uh, you know, customer... You know, we've sort of we've got a more even relationship with government. You know, we we got through the first round of uh, negotiations with the government on NBN. We've got some more work to do there. Uh, I think we've continued to push product innovation with the wireless networks, uh, IPTV, and uh, even just this Wi-Fi product we put into the market. I think that the culture. Change is one of those things that takes a long time, and but thankfully, we, you know, there's a culture in Telstra that is very oriented to the customer. But we needed to make that more prevalent, uh, and I think that we've done a lot in terms of getting our cost uh, under control by simplifying the business and really changing the way we run the business rather than just cutting. So, I think a fair report card, Stephen, but still a long way to go. Uh, David, I think I'll be a bit tougher on you than that. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, first of all, um, I, with those challenges that you, you, you set out there, I, I, I agree that you, 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 you did, did, did fine, all those things. That, that's right. Uh, I would add a fur, further challenge, which perhaps you didn't think of, um, but uh, you had to convert that investment in mobiles uh, into something really powerful in the market that, that, yep. that Tolstoy had made, and you did that too. You did that brilliantly. So, but no yeah. problem there at all. Yeah. Um, no, no. My criticism, uh, I think history won't judge you as well as you, you might have judged yourself. Um, um, that, that when you, You're a tough marker, really. <laughs> you've, you've, you've turned your com this company into an income stock. And mm -hmm. this is a growth company that has um, a large number of growth opportunities in, in medical areas, in new applications for businesses, in media. Yep. And, and you're paying out all the profits and dividends. Um, and, right. and near enough. You don't, 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 let's get uh, caught up in the detail. But basically, yeah. all the profits go out and dividend, all the cash goes out. Oh. Um, no, no, no. Wrong way. Go back. Mm. Um, um, uh, uh, if you're in a growth position, you should be selling the, your growth prospects to your shareholders. Wi-Fi was an interesting exercise, but it's small. Mm. Um, and 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 your yourself or your predecessor, your, your successor. With, is saddled with this enormous problem of being an income stock when and, and because you have not sold the growth potential. Okay. So, Robert, I really agree with you that uh, the challenge of the company is to find new growth portfolios going forward. I think the... And I'll come back and talk to you about what I think we have set as the foundations for future growth because I think we have done a lot in that area. However... I think in terms of the priorities for the business when I inherited it were unfortunately against 
a lot of the, getting the core sorted out because there's so much value in the core. So it's one of error and time. And do I agree that now, with some greater certainty on cash flows and a very strong balance sheet, does Telstra need to look for future growth opportunities? Absolutely right. However, I've got to say that I don't think that our shareholders and investors would have allowed us to do too much three years ago. Now, I think they will in the future. Uh, I think that we have earned the right uh, to go and invest in new opportunities, but it will be a balanced portfolio approach. But let me talk to you about what we have done, which sometimes I think uh, is lost because it's such a big company. So if you look over the period of some of the key decisions we've made, one is nearly three years ago we made a decision that Asia was going to be very important and we must own all our infrastructure assets in Asia and we brought reach back into the business, which is the old OTC. Uh, since then, we've set up for the first time in Telstra's history an integrated vertical division to serve enterprise customers right throughout Asia, in fact, internationally. And we've hired a completely different set of executives who have worked in Asia, and now we are trying to drive that business on a pan-Asian international basis. That's been a significant change. So that's number one. Number two, uh, we have also said that you know, digital media is a very important part of our business going forward. Uh, remember, we uh, work with Foxtel to buy Oddstar to make it the only pay TV company in the business. We've also rolled out IPTV, which now has over 600,000 users in Australia and we think great opportunity going forward, and we've done another other number of other content deals. Thirdly, we've set up a new health business unit, uh, which is still only 13, 14 months old, but we think there's enormous opportunity in, in health information solutions, and we will continue to drive that going forward. Uh, then we've also taken the assets that were in China, we sold one, which was in this uh, online real estate. We had to get out of that one because of the contract. But we've done an IPO on Auto Home, which is an online car sales. We invested a few hundred million dollars, trading now $3.5 billion. So I think there, and we are now looking at leveraging that further. So we have set some foundation blocks that I think will be very important for us going forward. And then lastly, we started a new ventures group to start to look at new innovative technologies that we think will provide us with good growth opportunities going forward. And these have been very deliberate strategies, really, over the last two and a half years. Now, have they seen the light of day? Are they mega transactions? No, no. But they are very important. So that's why I agree with you. Telstra must find. Uh, new growth opportunities going forward, as well as continuing to manage our core business as uh, effectively as we can. But when you say to your shareholders, um, mm -hmm. look, I have these growth opportunities. Yep. Instead of distributing all the profits, um, I want to distribute a, a, a less percentage than all of them. Right. We won't get specific about the percentages or... Yeah, no. the yeah, look, Robert, I think that Telstra is in a unique position because we both have, have two things. One is we have very strong cash flows, and secondly, we have a very strong balance sheet. So we have two uh, levers to pull. Now, in any uh, transition, uh, we have a, a very broad shareholder base, uh, you know, 1.4 million uh, retail shareholders, it probably means that we impact nearly you know, half to 60% of all homes in Australia that rely on a strong uh, dividend flow. So I have to live with that reality, and the board is very conscious of that. But also, we know we've got to invest in the future, that the world's changing quickly, uh, that our revenue stream's going to change by 2020 significantly. So I can assure you that there is a lot of energy and work going on around all these growth vectors uh, that just takes time.
David, as you've just detailed, I mean, you've, you've effectively planted some seeds for future growth across a number of areas. Yep. And I think you've said in the past you would like to see Telstra evolve into a global technology company. Now, if, the, if what you were doing today were to be fully matured, what would Telstra look like if it were a global technology company? Well, we'd still have a strong domestic business, but uh, which would both be in connectivity, but in more around the value creation opportunities around uh, how we'd be playing in the health industry, playing in education, uh, really enabling uh, the use of technology in all those sectors. Uh, that will mean that we're far stronger in, uh, in software, and because software is sort of the uh, energy which enables people to do things differently, and hopefully those businesses would be both very strong in Australia and globally. We will continue to invest in companies and mobile companies in Asia if the opportunities present themselves in terms of being an attractive investment, but we're not going to just do it because they're there. So we would be, hopefully, a global company with strong base in Australia, strong in software across industry solutions, uh, working around the world. That would be where we see it. Is this a five-year vision, a 10-year vision, or a 20-year vision? That... Oh, look, I think that um, it's it's got to be significant within five years and continue to grow out over 10 and 20. Uh, it's got Telstra has got to become a global company to be able to deliver returns to our shareholders. The domestic market's not big enough for us. Uh, and we've got to go where there will be greater growth. Okay. If, if you look at our... Uh, what do you think in five years' time? Um, just take the Australian business a moment. What, what would it look like? What, um, how does it change? Um, you know, what sort of different services will people want? Um, how will the industry be changing? What will we do differently in the homes? What's your um, operating map uh, in terms of what's likely to happen? Well, the only way you can do that, Robert, is you've got to go and look at how we'll be using technology and when you, uh, in, in five years' time, I mean, very hard to predict because look at the incredible change that's taken place around Google, Facebook, uh, innovative companies like that. But one thing we are very sure about uh, our ability to consume content and information will continue to grow exponentially. We'll see greater use of video uh, in the home, in the business, both video conferencing but just consumption of media content will just continue to grow exponentially. The other critical thing is that in that the way we communicate will continue to evolve uh, with new innovative ways to interact with information the strength in terms of neurotechnology, uh, the strength in terms of artificial intelligence, and technology will continue to disrupt industries and the way traditional services and tra traditional business models are being done today. So if you go anywhere in the world in the technology space, be it financial services, be it insurance services, be it uh, in health services, education, fundamental disruption. And we need things to be simpler. You know, we need to have better interfaces into technology so that it's more uh, intuitive, simpler, and less complex. So when you lay out that future and you think about your personal life, your home, or a business, or a government, there are enormous opportunities to which to apply technology to those opportunities. And that's what this company will look like. It'll be about a technology enabler about creating value from deploying innovative con connectivity and technology into these business, home, and individual situations that really change the way we live, work, and, uh, and learn. That's what we're about. Now, the other critical thing that's going to happen is that it will be a world that is, is connected. Be You think of the number of digital devices you have in your home. Uh, every one of those will be connected to the Internet, and it needs to be done in a simple and easy way. And all our development and, and work here in Australia in our research labs 
continues to be about how to create that. So I see a very rich future uh, in terms of what their business opportunities, and to do that, the business will restructure around still running infrastructure, but being far more at the front end about being technology enablers. That give you a bit of a sense? That in relation to that connectivity in in this market as opposed to um, outside the country. Going forward, you'll you'll have the wireless business and you'll have these um, legacy cash flows off the fixed line business, but you won't actually control the fixed network. Does that impact your ability to, to be innovative and creative and, 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 and um, connecting customers? No, not at all. It's a different type of innovation, Stephen, um, because it's about applying technology. Um, but you look at um, you know anyone in Silicon Valley, they don't own the network and they're very innovative. So that's why we've got to re-equip and reorient ourselves to be an, an enabler of the use of technology and really uh, driving into applications and software. That comes back to my original point. And the wonderful thing about software is a global industry. If you're not bound by physical infrastructure. That's why it's so important we innovate. That's why we're building out our digital media business. That's why we're building out our uh, health solutions business. That's why we continue to invest in our emergency services networks and all these new areas that we've been investing in over the last two to three years. Um, one of the things you've been fortunate in is that both Optus and Vodafone, for their own separate situations, didn't go ahead as, as they'd have hoped to have gone ahead. Um, I get the impression that perhaps Vodafone's going to have another go. Um, uh, would you agree with that? And is there a possibility we might have a a Qantas Virgin exercise where you actually get challenged? Uh, I think, Robert, uh, I, I don't always like defining our success in terms of other people's failures. I no, think no, it's, it's part of it. Um, but, but, but it's a combination of all. Yep. Um, look, we've been always been very clear about what we stand for. We've always said that we believe that networks make a difference. We've always invested in having the, you know, the, as one of the some of the best wireless technology in the world. You know, we were first in rolling out 3G, one of the first rolling out LTE. We've been the first to uh, run a, an LTE network of 450 megabits per second. So we're going to continue to build for innovation and differentiate on customer service. Now. Uh, customers have to make their own decisions uh, about that. We re need to remain competitive, and when I say competitive, is a fair value premium. And I think that uh, for everyone in the industry, we want a healthy industry. But will it be competitive? Yes. Uh, but I think you know it's been a competitive industry for the last ten years. Uh, if both of us starting to invest again, which. Um, um, you know, yeah, I mean, uh, and, I, and I think that's good. I think that's what I like about the market. But I just want to remind you that you know, our network is 2.3 million square kilometres, and uh, and I think the nearest network probably is less than half of it. So, uh, you know, I think because we have invested in in technology, because we have you know been willing to put our capital at risk, our shareholders' money at risk, and we've got a good return. I think that has put us in a very strong position. In other words, you think you're too far ahead. <laughs> I'm saying that I think that we, because we have made that calculated investment, I think it has given us a strong position in the market. <laughs> David, you're in the uh, deep into negotiations with the government and MBN Co about the new set of arrangements um, for, the, for the new MBN. Uh, the verdict and committee hasn't reported yet, but do you think it's conceivable that you will actually be allowed to own fixed um, infrastructure? Uh, for instance, to use the HSC for uh, the full range of uh, communications? Um, I think it's very important for the government to be very clear on this point. The fundamental assumption of the build of the NBN that it would be the only wholesale network in Australia. That was the assumption. 
if they want to change that assumption, they must maintain a, a level playing field where anyone can go and invest in competing infrastructure. That's what they decide to do. I'm more than happy to play by those rules. Or, alternatively, if they decide not to, we'll play by those rules. But we need clarity. And that's what I think uh, the Vertican Review needs to do, and I think, therefore, uh, the government. But the assumption was very clear in the bill of the NBN that it would be the only fixed-line infrastructure in Australia, and it would be wholesale owner. TPG is challenging that assumption. TPG uh, is challenging that assumption, uh, as we have in terms of uh, we can put fibre to the basement any time we like, and we have that going as well. However, it, there, it is a loophole, and I think the government needs to move to be clear about what they want to do. I'm happy to live in either world, but it is very unclear at the moment. David, I can take you to a different area. You mentioned health several times. Yep. You probably, you probably didn't read the piece I wrote the day or so back showing that the Marwin model um, is uh, capable of substantially reducing uh, our health costs, a little capital outlay. Yep. Um, do you believe, and there could be other models too, but not yep. where to do any particular model, do you believe there is an opportunity to substantially reduce health costs by better communication? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it, there are just so many use cases, Robert, in terms of how better use of uh, remote health management, uh, health care in the home, uh, better information flows can substantially reduce the number of consultations, the number of uh, bed days in hospital, uh, the way services delivered the way prescriptions are you know, both administered and prescribed you know the 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 list is just enormous and I think with the what holds it up David mm hmm what holds it up this has been around for a while I'm not blaming you but, but, but this, no no this, no no the, well, the ability it, to do this has been around for a while and it doesn't have no look there, there, I think there's a, a number of reasons one is uh, it's a very complicated industry uh, you're dealing with people's livelihoods, uh, and therefore the appetite for change is low. It's a very highly regulated industry, uh, but it is absolutely ready for change, and it must change, uh, and we can get better health service outcomes as well as for lower cost. And, uh, and I think every country in the world is trying to work through this, and I think that, that they are the impediments and it is just not an industry that changes quickly. And rightly so, because you're dealing with people's health and well-being. David, with the... Uh, the, the Bauer model. Sorry. Have a look at the Bauer model when you get a chance. Okay, <laughs> I will. I definitely it's working. Uh, David, with the CSL and census deals uh, and restructuring some of your Chinese investments, you've yeah. actually seen, you've got a big lump of ca cash coming yeah. uh, and you've simplified the portfolio. Yeah. Um, is there any more of that kind of rationalisation to come, and given that you, you will also be generating substantial um, free cash flows this, this year, when are you going to tell the shareholders what you're going to do with that balance of capacity? Right. So uh, in terms of uh, letting shareholders know, I mean, as you know, Stephen, it's the board decision, uh, but I can assure you that our capital management uh, plans are well discussed at every board meeting, and we are very conscious of... Uh, our retail shareholder base, uh, but also for the need to grow. So it will be a balanced approach as we go forward, uh, but that is a board decision. Uh, but is, it, is it likely that, that the shareholders are given some insight um, before the end of this year? Um, I think that you know we've got to uh, you know see the year out, and I think that that would be the appropriate time of you know when we next update the market. Uh, but uh, in terms of the uh, what we're going to do with the cash, as you write, you say, what, is there anything more to happen in terms of the portfolio management? Look, we, we continue to look at the portfolio all the time, um, and both from divestment and investment and trying to maximise the return for shareholders. Um, 
sometimes better than others, uh, Stephen. Uh, but I think that we've, you know, we've done some big transactions this year, and I think that uh, there isn't anything, you know, on the short-term horizon. Uh, but we'll continue to look at opportunities that come our way. Okay. Last one, Bob. All right. <laughs> yeah, David, we've taken a lot of your time. Uh, we very much appreciate uh, you, you making yourself available. And uh, I hope the, the next five years will be as good as the last. Thank you, Stephen. <laughs> I, I look forward to having a, a uh, fruitful and open relationship with you going forward. 